have a question to Derek. When you put, uh, produce these replicas of the Gabo sculptures in the museum, how do you prevent that in later generations they might come to market? Yeah. Um, that was certainly a concern, and it's because it has happened with quite a few other artists. Um, one of the ones was about how they were marked. There was no question of simply writing on the piece um, that it was a replica. We had to um, impress, stamp deep into the plastic the, uh, the details of it, it being a replica and the date it was made, and give it a number because they're anticipating that more will be made and these will be sort of added to the catalogue resume as, um, as a sort of appendix. Uh, but that it's a real concern. And this also why they took such trouble in drawing up the legal contract, because they saw this as being a sort of template for future agreements with other museums, maybe even with other um, private collectors. Hi, my question is also for Derek. Um, my name is Elena Torak. I'm a conservator at the Dallas Museum of Art and also coincidentally working on that piece that you just showed. Um, it's back in the lab. The plastic's actually in great condition. I think it's because it's, in, it's a faux ivory and it's not a clear plastic, but there are, there's a history of repair that's not in great condition, so there's adhesive that's, that's starting to fail. Um, and so my work has been, you know, for the past few months, just trying to figure out exactly when those were applied. And I've been able to figure out that there's at least three repairs that I know of. One by Gabo, one by Pevsner in the 1950s associated when it broke, and then a major one done by Charles Wilson in the 1980s. And I've been corresponding with him. And I know that, you know, around the time that this was repaired, that he also, he was working on 20 to 30 pieces, you know, shortly after Gabo died. I think my question is, is just, um, you know, when you choose to replicate an object, you're, you're choosing to replicate its, its appearance at a particular moment in time, and how you've had to consider the history of potential repairs, you know, even by Gabo himself and things like that when you're planning for, when you're planning for a, pr a process like this. Yeah. Um, it's interesting what you say about the Dallas head, because I was there a couple of years ago, and uh, I thought there was beginning to be a little bit of warping mm -hmm. happening, but um, certainly because the it's, it's a filled um, cellulose nitrate, I think that has protected it. Just it's, an, it's an acetate, yeah, it's, we did, oh, is it acetate? We did okay, XRF sure. and we know it's got, it's yeah. got zinc and titanium based I think, pigments in it. I think it's it the same us. way that, you know, rubber car tires, because they're so filled with, um, they don't deteriorate as quickly as, as rubber bands. Um, what was the question? Uh, when the last the last slide that I showed um, was one of the replicas, and that had been um, repaired, probably by Charles Wilson, uh, because we, it it was a piece that dated from the 1920s, and yet it had perspex um, acrylic additions to it. Uh, what we I mentioned evidence a lot because that's what we kept coming back to. What was the evidence for what we had? And we, we tried only to go back to what we were sure had been there. Um, but then interpretation did come into it when we found we had uh, templates in the archive that um, showed the, the shape that Gabba had worked from. And it turned out they weren't always quite the same as what we found on the models. I mean, he was an artist. He was he made decisions as he went along. Um, so it was th there is interpretation when you do uh, this sort of replication. It's one of the things that bothers me a lot. Um, Jeanette, uh, first of all, thank you very much. And I wanted to ask you what the foundation's thinking is on the possibility of replication. Uh, I'm thinking of Annie's work, not not uh, not his work. Stand up. There have been copies of Annie Albers' work. The um, her, uh, a weaver who was also at the Bauhaus with, with her, Gunther Stolzl, has made copies, authorized copies of Annie Albers' work. Most of those are in um, the Neues Museum in Munich. Um, this is an interesting question because I think we're just now grappling with it. And it, the issue is, one of the, one of the questions is exhibition copies. 
which I don't have an answer for. But another one um, has to do with work that is going on with fiber and textile research related to Bauhaus work. One of the things that the Bauhaus weavers did was make multiple very small samples that were going to be potentially used as a commercial production as, as the Bauhaus was seeking to become uh, viable as a commercial agency. And they're brilliant in their mat the materials that they're used, that were used, and they're brilliant in the, the structure of the weavings. And you have to be such a specialist to understand that, and you have to be able to touch and take apart the weavings. So there's a group of uh, weavers, textile conservators, and historians, sometimes all in one person, who have made some copies of these and have come to us and asked, can we make copies of Sonny, some of Annie Albers weavings? To which I said, yes, <laughs> because of its educational value, but um, obviously it's a kind of discussion and, and it, it's all the things that Derek is talking about, but somewhat different because of the nature of these textiles as being meant for commercial production. Um, that's it so far. No unauthorized prints, no posthumous uh, things. We have reproduced some of Joseph's furniture to test its viability for market production. I sort of have a follow-on question for that. Um, this was Diane Neumeyer, <laughs> the artist from Rutgers University, also an academic. I'm Virginia Rutledge, an attorney and art historian, and I have a question for you. Have you been approached about licensing um, Annie Albers' work? We do license Annie Albers' works. That's a related thing, but it's a little bit different. Um, Christopher Farr uh, produces. I'm going to talk about this in as adult a manner as possible because I don't like some of the reproductions. I, I'm not all for a weaving that becomes a carpet, but that's the kind of licensing that's been done. There's also been licensing of like throw pillows and shower curtains, but that's, that's not antithetical to th the way that the Albers is thought. And when we think about intentionality and that they would be all for it, um, Albers encountered reproductions on fabric of his paintings, and he notes it in his notebook with bemusement and that didn't think that much about it. Um, and that is appropriate these are, because these are design works, many of them, rather than artworks, and that, that's the line in between them. So there is licensing. Um, we've licensed um, reproductions of Joseph Albers' tables that I think you can buy now at the Museum of Modern Art, a set of stacking tables with glass-colored tops. <coughs> Very desirable. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you both for your comments. And Jeanette, the, the way you ended your presentation I feel like is a point to start a conversation in terms of where an organization becomes an institution and thinking about the difference between both of your talks, one at a museum, at, at the Tate, one a private organization, institution, and kind of what the benefits are of both of those choices and how you think about an artist's legacy vis-a-vis being on their own as opposed to in an institution surrounded by other organizations. So I guess this question is for both of you, but also for any of the other panelists, thinking about maybe how do you, when you're working on Gabo's work and you have a vast archive of other artists and materials and projects that you're drawing on, you know, how do you kind of struggle with that? Did you think at some point about um, you know, placing the work in an institution, and not every artist can afford to have their own entity and their own organization. So perhaps this is, if you both could comment on how that works, and maybe somebody. I've been at the Albers Foundation for 10 years. The executive director has been there for 41 years and our chief curator has been there for over almost 35 years. So, uh, and we have trustees and they're interested collectors and supporters. And so it's a, it's a bigger conversation than I can answer. Um, I would say this, um, Albers Foundation is not one of the super rich foundations. <laughs> and Joseph Albers as an artist did not live to see the art boom of the 1980s. 
and uh, for lots of different reasons. I mean, it's a different kind of market, and it's a different, it's a different approach. And also, um, it's like in all artist foundations, I think the people who work there are enormously dedicated to their artists. I can't imagine that we would merge our collections with someone else because the, um, it's not just the art, it's a legacy of ethical practice, educational practice that I think drives the foundation. And because we're talking about conservation and objects today, that's been the focus of, of my conversation, but it could go in other directions as well. Um, clear, clearly, there are a lot of advantages in being in a big institution with the sort of resources of skills um, that are there, but there's not as much money as you might think. Um, these institutions, are, well, certainly the Tate has a bigger development department than a conservation department, the people who are trying to raise money um, as opposed to those who are actually doing the work. And. Um, we were very conscious that we were sort of setting uh, an example um, that could be, we hoped, copied to that, setting a standard, if you like. I mentioned benchmark, I think, uh, and that was very important to us. But uh, it took a long time to, to actually raise the money to, we got tremendous support in the end from um, the Andrew Mellon Foundation uh, and it was important to have the, uh, if you like, the moral backing of the, of the estate, the copyright holders. Um, and it was in, we got onto questions like uh, if the replicas were regarded as a success in terms of standards and achieving the, you know, the initial aim, um, should the Tate be in the position of actually making more for people who wanted their own copies of these things, which is coming very close to the market uh, aspect. Of course, it, it, it hasn't happened, but it was a question that was raised, and that's what happens when you, you start down this line, that you get into these very interesting uh, areas about what it is you're really um, dealing with and what is, what is authentic or... Valid, maybe is a better word. Um, my name is Suzanne Quigley, and I've got a question that sort of follows up to what you were saying, and that has to do with um, the rep multiple replicas and exhibition copies and additioned works. It seems to me that you're creating additions of replicas, but then you, you talk about it playing into the market, so I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit further on that. As far as I know, there's no intention of expanding into the market, that this is purely a way of uh, conserving, preserving his legacy, uh, Gabo's legacy, um, making the, uh, the three-dimensional image available for the future. Uh, it, it was, I don't think there was any um, serious intention of doing that, but there was, an awareness that somebody might propose doing that in the future, and that that was why it was sort of ruled out in the contract after a certain amount of conversation. And, and exhibition copies, um, some of them live on, where um, many times an exhibition copy is, it's required that it's destroyed after the uh, venue. So, uh, and then the idea of additioning things too, it's, um, yeah, Sticky. there was there was no question of addition of additioning, but um, exhibition copies are are made for the either because the um, the original no longer is exists or can't be transported or is too fragile or has changed dramatically for some reason, um, and when I th when it belongs to a, an institution maybe. Um, they know they're probably that's probably going to be requested again for an, for another exhibition, and you know there's just a practical aspect of, uh, of hanging on to it until it's wanted. But if the art, you know, if we're talking about living artists, then they can specify what you know what happens to it. Um, uh, Robert Morris, I think, it was um, an example in his lifetime of. of uh, a lot of exhibition copies were made. Thank you. 
uh, I'm Ursula uh, von Riddingsvard, and I'm an artist. And it gives me <coughs> pain to hear <coughs> of your making additions, even copying the work. You know, and for the exhibitions, why should the exhibitions have something, you know, less than what it is? And, and I fear that there's something that is, not something, but I'll bet that there's a good bit of the soul of the work that is being lost. It's very, very hard to duplicate. And it's not just like duplicating, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> It's not just like duplicating, you know, something like a pipe, you know, that, that, that's a railing or, you know, where it doesn't really make a difference. But the specifics of what is done in that work is extraordinarily important. <coughs> God, this was not the right moment to... <coughs> Uh, and it is so upsetting to hear now that, you know, the markets are tickling with additions. You know, it, it's, it's so, um, it's, it's really, really upsetting. Even with my life, and I've been working for, it, with, with my artwork for almost like 35 years, and, and I don't make duplicates of any of my cedar, works in cedar. I have now come to a point where I make works in, in bronze, you know, but even then the additions are very small and I oversee each bronze and I patina the bronze. And there's a worry that I have that when the bronze, which, is, which lasts 2,000 years approximately, <clears throat> but the patina doesn't, the patina lasts a much, much shorter time you know, that somebody's going to be painting these pieces. But I, I think this conversation is just really, really upsetting, you know, about the, the addition, you know, about making art that's not art anymore. No. I, 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 I don't get it, you know, and I don't, I don't care how simple it is, you know, like we're talking about the Elbers. Yes, it's simple. But there's a magical line that he crosses that makes it what it is that, that you can't do, that nobody else can do, even if he puts his menu on what was done. You know, it's another hand that is gliding through the surface of that. So I, I, I don't, I'm not understanding it. Well. First of all, I think it's great you're saying this and that it's being recorded because it's really important to know what your views as the artist are, particularly about your work um, and what you want to happen or not happen to it. Uh, I didn't mention additioning and the, there's, there was no additioning as such done you or intended. many, you know, some. No, it's not just one that it, gets duplicated. It was, yeah. Um, and that's what my talk was about, really, how we started from a position, uh, um, an intuitive, emotional position, just like yours, of saying uh, replicas, copies are somehow wrong. Um, but then finding, with discussion and uh, debate, the inherent vice meeting and so on, that there were some occasions, some specific cases, where there could be justification. Now, you might not agree with the justification, but it wasn't arrived at easily or, or lightly. Um, and one of the things that I think everybody has learned from the past is that, yes, things like the Rodchenko, um, Schwitters, copies that have been made, very poor copies that have been made and escaped onto the um, art market are, are a pitfall that m we mustn't go there. But um, it's, it is a concern, it's a concern to me that um, more and more things around us are not quite what they seem. Um, and that's, I think, at the back of was my, uh, my hesitation about the whole thing that there, was too, there were too many um, 
things that are presented to us as genuine that aren't and that yes we were we were taking a, a risk and making a, a difficult decision about making the you know deciding to preserve the gabos and i don't want to argue with with you it's not my intent because i have i love you know what the i mean the conservators are an extremely extremely important p part of an artist's making of their work i've worked with with christian many many times and he does it with such such care and and his first uh uh commandment is do not make the worse do, do do not make the art worse you know than it was you know by beautifying it by you know by doing things that you think will make it a better a better thing but and i know that all of you are really you know so conscientious and you're trying to think it through with such clarity but it, to me it's just not when you when you make it over from scratch you know it's not it it's not that work well i, I because think because every think you're work has its own complexities that you can't cross no matter how simple it looks i think you're being a little light in saying making it from scratch because i was trying to make the point that we were um, being extremely careful not to make anything from scratch. No, I understand, but I saw, you know, some of the, the devastation, you know, yeah. and I, I almost think, I don't know, I, I, I should stop now. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I share all your concerns, Ursula and also Derek, and I think we spoke about at the replica workshop in length uh, about uh, the ethics, but also like who is actually making these copies of these replicas. And I'm a little bit concerned for our profession as conservators. Are we starting now to make copies or replicas or do we stay with the, like within our realm of working with the original as much as possible and then stop? Or do we, I mean, we are very well from our knowledge, from our skills, we are very well equipped to make copies and replicas and even fakes, but we, we have this natural line of stopping there, and I totally understand this is a unique case, uh, but I think in the afternoon we will also hear from uh, Jeffrey and Francesca uh, the difference between uh, the artist made the work or the work was fabricated by someone else, and I think that's, that's a big distinction. And I just came back from uh, from Basel, from the Bruce Nauman show, and like all the neons were basically redone, and they were not only not always done in the original color, but they were done better, uh, or they were done as they looked on the photographs. And the artist was fine with everything. He was, he just said, mainly it glows. And uh, so I think we have to be very careful about our profession, what we like how far we can go and I mean this is an endless discussion it's been on going on now for 15 years uh, but we should not, not forget about this. Conservator, hello Nora Nagy. I have uh, two uh, issues one um, to answer to some degree to Ursula um, I think we all very seriously thinking about all of uh, your concerns and that's part of the reason why we are talking about all of these things and trying things and then give up and then go back again and think again and uh, talk with artists. I think our baseline is that we never assume that any replica, even the most perfect we can produce, uh, is uh, even close to the identical of the original. And it's an absolute baseline that uh, we always underline that it is a replica and it has to be very, very clear. We will always miss something which is in the original and that's why we keep the original. However, there are instances of which we probably already learned in art history that if we don't keep uh, the artist's uh, work alive in some form of memory uh, and uh, the artist is not seen, the artist will be forgotten. If we keep something uh, in safe storage for, 
500 years and nobody sees it, including art historians and other professionals, it might be completely forgotten for history and for uh, our cultural benefit. So there are some, I would call crutches, uh, which are occasionally, as a last resort, are important, and these could be potentially replicas. There are some issues where uh, this is the best to keep something alive. Think of your great-grandfather you never met, but how would you treasure a photograph of it, just a black and white snapshot? If you ever had one, that would give you back something from the actual great-grandfather you have never seen. So I think there is some room which we can very, very carefully examine to what degree and how uh, we actually might serve the artist if uh, we think of these things. Uh, I am extremely thankful that you expressed your uh, opinion because there are some artists where it is not possible at all, but with some others it is. And uh, as conservators and keeping artists alive and their legacies alive, we do have to approach these avenues and think about it and try, or at least philosophically, go through the exercise. I have another question to uh, Janet. Thank you very much for your lecture. It's very impressive. And I am uh, really um, impressed how closely it looks like you are working with conservators. My question is, how do you actively uh, reach out to find conservators? If you could talk a little bit more about this, because we do understand that conservators approach you, but I am assuming it goes the other way around, and that would be interesting for us. The foundation itself, uh, works in our collection are treated by Contemporary Conservation Limited. However, we work uh, with private collections, or we, we receive inquiries about condition issues um, from private collections and from museums across the country and around the world. And um, we don't always have a, a conservation contact for that, but whenever one does arrive, we're, arise, we're able to consult on what we know about the particular condition issue, what we know about the materials that were used. And a lot of that now is primarily of an archival nature driven by me, I'm an art historian, not a conservator, but I'm hungry for information that goes a little bit deeper into the differences in the paints and the differences in the grounds and uh, so that we can provide that information to, to uh, conservators other, other places. Conversely, a lot of the information that we do get does come from independent conservators who share treatment reports or share their research with us, and mu particularly museum-based conservators who've been able, who had the opportunity to take the time to look deeply into the works in their collection. Does that answer your question? More or less? Yeah. Thanks, it's Mark Lightcap from the Mike Kelly Foundation. That was really great, both you guys. Jeanette, following up on what you were just saying, I'm curious when you get conservation inquiries and when you're working on the catalog resume and you come across works that have just become a shadow of their former selves, uh, how do you, as an organization, like what, how does the foundation deal with that? And just to dogpile another question that's kind of totally unrelated, I think, uh, and maybe this will happen later, but. Uh, it would be interesting to hear both of you kind of parse out a little bit more on the idea of what constitutes something being genuine, particularly when you're dealing with artists like Mike Kelly, uh, where it's a very complicated practice. There's the artist's magic fairy dust sprinkled around, but then there's also manufactured goods and outsourcing, and um, maybe that's a conversation for later. But. It, with, with regard to authenticity for Joseph Albers and for his paintings, I would say it's a pretty easy. In, in, in the annals of authenticity, he's, he's so good. <laughs> there are very few people that have that hand and very few people who have the time or the will. And also, uh, m most forgers aren't that good. And um, they only have to fool one person. And so, however, when I began to see these high resolution digital 3D imaging that was coming out of art analysis and research, one of the thoughts I had is, I do not want these large files to <laughs> get in the hands of a 3D printer. Um, but there are a lot of backups for that. What was the first question? 
Uh, it had to do with uh, artworks that were just toast. Oh, um, yeah. Sometimes it's difficult because you have the owner of the artwork there. And that's where coming from a large, complicated, emotionally fam family and some diplomatic training helps because you have to tell this person that their painting is in bad shape and needs treatment and uh, hold back or adumbrate the idea that it's not savable, but they should look into it. Um, that's about what I would say. For the catalog resume, I mean, that's, that's easily handled with footnotes. I mean, you can, you can say that this work is identified as having been overpainted, that the work was destroyed, the work suffered uh, significant damage, or that there was, um, the, the photograph shown is a, the work in, this, in its state in, say, 1952. Significant overpainting took place in 1977. So it's, that's a simple matter of documentation, if you know about it. Um, I'd, I'd just say that we're, we're not in the business of connoisseurship. Um, we look very closely uh, at things and research them and analyze them and provide information on what we see and what we find. And then how that's interpreted, um, that really sort of involves a lot more people uh, and, and an other expertise. But what we can do is look very closely and, um, and give you information about what we see. <laughs>